You're listening to Protect It All, where Aaron Crow expands the conversation beyond just OT, delving into the interconnected worlds of IT and OT cybersecurity. Get ready for essential strategies and insights. Here's your host, Aaron Crow. Hey, welcome to the show. Why don't you introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and a little bit about your background and, and uh, the company that you guys run. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for having me on the show. My name is Savak Avakians. I'm the founder and CEO of Intelligent Artifacts. Uh, at Intelligent Artifacts, we have completely solved AI ML's black box problem. So that's our, our company. We have a platform that we use to replace uh, underlying neural networks with this specific transparent technology. Uh, and we could talk more about that as we go. Yeah. Man, let's dig in. So AI, everybody wants to talk AI, right? So I, I work in cybersecurity in both the IT side and the OT side, OT being like critical infrastructure and power plants. Everybody sees this AI thing coming um, and, and <clears throat> lots of us are wanting to use it and benefit from it. Obviously there's pros and cons, there's risks, there's things that we need to be aware of. So let's dig into that. Like, like talk about, so you talked about you solved this thing underlying, like dig into that, explain a little bit, you know, remember some of the audience may have, you know, a brief understanding Understanding of AI and their their level of AI may be Chat GPT, right? So that's right. different than than you know true AI and, and all the other underlying things that you can use in a in a in, you know enterprise type environment. Right. Yeah. Let's let's get into it a little bit deeper because uh, the public has uh, a misunderstanding of what the scientists are working on, um, and usually you know the public believes that the scientists have it all figured out and everyone's in agreement on everything, and the reality is that's not. The truth, right? So yeah. um, traditionally, there have been two different ways of approaching artificial intelligence. There was a bottom-up approach using what's called connectionist theory. And that approach is uh, what we now know of neural nets. Like if you've heard of machine learning today, mm -hmm. chat GPT, DALI, like all of those technologies that have machine learning, Today, they are all built on top of neural net technologies. So these are open source techniques. They've been around since the 1960s, even before uh, with something called the Perceptron. But they've evolved. Uh, they've had uh, a huge lift recently because of what a breakthrough in deep learning. Uh, so these are very large models, neural net models, uh, that have been able to automatically do really incredible things that were uh, not possible in the past. Like pe people uh, knew that at some point we could get there, but uh, they weren't able to do with, with uh, what was around at the time. Uh, so those bottom-up approaches, all you do is you send the data, and it automatically identifies and extracts features from that data that it thinks are important in order to make the predictions that it does. Okay. okay. Um, so the, the nice thing about this is, you know, any novice engineer, uh, anyone who's an amateur could go in there and uh, start building a neural net without having to understand the data in any way, right? Sure. Uh, you just throw the data at the neural net, you keep iterating on this until you, your outputs look like what you want them to look like, right? And that's called the training period. Mm -hmm. And once you're getting the metrics that you want, uh, that's done with that model and you freeze it and you put it out into production and then all hell breaks loose and we'll, we can talk about that in a little, little bit. <laughs> the, the other approach was a top-down approach and that was called symbolic AI. And, and over the years, uh, different terms have been thrown out and that's mostly because of the way funding had dried up and people try to pivot the technology and, and remarket it uh, to, to make it sound uh, appealing again or slightly different. And that happens in AI I'm in both camps all the time. Uh, we've had several AI winters. I'm hoping we don't have another one because of all the hype. But the top-down approach, the thinking was this. Look, we don't need to simulate what brains are, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the neural net approach, you're, you're trying to simulate the structure of a brain. Uh, but we don't know enough about how brains actually work. And neuroscientists will tell you, the ones that have looked on uh, looked into these artificial neural networks that this is not how brains work at all. <laughs> sure. So that those models are, are completely wrong uh, as far as cognition science goes, like uh, as far as neuroscience goes. Mm -hmm. The symbolic AI people were, were saying, look, we don't build airplanes by simulating birds, right? 
we don't have flapping wings with feathers right. on it and all that other stuff. What we've done is we've identified the functions that are relevant for the case. For example, the Bernoulli equation allows us to calculate the lift over a wing, right? So as mm -hmm. it travels across the top of the wing, uh, it'll move faster than the bottom, and that creates a uh, pressure differential generating lift. Right. Right? So the symbolic AI people were saying, look, let's just figure out the functions of cognition and write code that represents those functions. This top-down approach is 100% explainable, right? You could go in there, you could look at the code, you could understand if this data came in, what the output should be, and if the output's not that, you go back into your code and bug fix, right? Sure. Completely transparent, 100% traceable too, right? right? So you could identify the prediction came all the way because of this specific function or rule or data point. Right. Um, so they had actually huge success in the early 80s, but the problem with their uh, solution was that it doesn't scale, right? Uh, you had to have a lot of really smart subject matter experts writing these rules sure. by hand so that these systems could produce the outputs that they expected. Um, the ultimate goal of it, though, wasn't to write like these rules uh, for every domain. It was really to find the rules or the rule set for general thinking in the first place, right? Okay. General intelligence. Sure. And that turned out to be a really hard problem to solve, right? Right. Not impossible, but really hard problem to solve. Um, so both of these solutions have their advantages and their disadvantages. In fact, some of the advantages are also their disadvantages, right? Um, for neural nets, the fact that it extracts the features that it thinks are important actually introduces biases mm -hmm. into the solution. Uh, if it believes that, for example, um, I, I'm sure your audience knows about redlining, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if the data set had uh, house pricing or it was about getting loans sure. uh, and they used your zip code, Right. Well, there's bias inherent in there, even though you're, you're not seeing that specific data point as being uh, biased. Right. Right. The zip code, you think, well, this shouldn't be a, a, a matter of bias, but we know about redlining and how that has introduced bias into that same exact data set. Sure. Right. On the flip side, the top down approach is they demand to explicitly put in the features that are relevant, right? Uh, so an advantage to that is that we know exactly what goes into it. Disadvantage mm -hmm. right? uh, to that is for lazy people like myself, you know, <laughs> we have to do uh, additional work. Uh, so it would have been nice if those systems could also learn from data, right? right? And that's where we come in. So uh, we. We basically audited the entire field, looked at the different ways things work and things didn't work, uh, mm -hmm. came up with a list of things that we demand of our artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, systems. And we created a whole new category from scratch, bottom up. Okay. Uh, and we call that Gaius. And originally Gaius, so a little bit of history around Gaius. Originally, it stood for General Artificial Intelligence using SOAR. SOAR was a cognitive architecture from that symbolic camp. Uh, mm -hmm. And my intention was to have a plug-in to kind of prove out that this alternate path is viable. So let's start using it instead of all mm -hmm. these other things that are failing. Over the years, uh, that changed, and uh, we had to build guys again from scratch to make it more general because we bumped into some issues from those cognitive architectures that are inherent within them. Just like the black box issue is an inherent intrinsic problem of neural net technologies that there's no way to solve, right? You, you can't solve it. You have to try a different technology for it. Um, so today, you know, you, you may have watch some of the congressional hearings on AI mm -hmm. and people are talking about 
well, we're, we're going to put some guardrails around these things. You know, we're going to make them safer. We're going to make them this and that or whatever. That's very problematic, right? right. Um, in fact, you're always going to be behind the eight ball if you go down that, that path. Trying to put guardrails around these complex systems that are black boxes that you can't fix, it's just increasing the complexity of the system without addressing the underlying issue. Right? So it, it's kind of like if you went to the doctor and you had all these you know, aches and pains and your doctor's just throwing all these different medications at you and maybe he's taking care of some of the symptoms, right? right? But the underlying cause isn't solved, right. which means you're still diseased. You're right. still sick, yeah. right? So that means at some point, those roosters are going to come home to roost. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and, and, and that's that's true in so many levels, right, is is we've got, especially in that analogy, right, is is the people that are trying to set up the guardrails don't understand the technology. Um, you know, you've seen that in the con congressional hearings around like Facebook and social media and these congressmen and senators that are asking questions about something as simple as social media and how it works just don't get it so how can we expect and, and i've spent time at, at on on capitol hill and talking with congressmen and senators there's no way they can understand they're not technical people right they're they're not they're not ai scientists they're not you know technologists they're, that's just not what their role is right so these are the people that are responsible for you know setting those boundaries and yes they have advisors and people are giving them guidance and they do bring experts on to, to help advise them but still it's 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 hard to grasp the, the the magnitude and and it's also the same type of problem like it's a difference between you know whitelisting and blacklisting you know antivirus technology like it can only block the things that it knows are bad as opposed to I only want you to do this and this anything else assume no Right. Unless I tell you otherwise, you can only do I only want you to you know, swing the hammer. Like, I don't want you to do anything else. If anybody asks you to do anything else, the answer is no. And you can only hit these nails, these 12 nails that are in front of you. That's the only thing you can do. Anything else is a no. And you have to explicitly give it better permission or different permission. It's like my child. You know, you can't do these certain things instead of saying, you know, trying to blacklist every possible thing they could, could come up with of things that they're going to try to do as a toddler. Like that would be a never ending <laughs> loss. <laughs> I, I know that for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and cyber is actually a great analog to yeah. uh, what's happening in AI today, because what happened with cyber in the past, and, and my background is also, uh, I used to work as a cybersecurity analyst for the Federal yep. Reserve, doing it for the entire Federal Reserve system and the US Treasury. So we were embedded in this. And in the past, you know, people developed software uh, and they weren't concerned about the cyber implications of that software. Mm -hmm. They figured, you know what, we'll, we'll put up some guardrails later. We'll tack right. on stuff later down the line. And nowadays we know that that is the wrong way to develop software. Yeah. Security has to be part of the very beginning of that whole development process. So we've learned lessons from the cyber world. And I feel like sometimes uh, we're not applying the same lessons learned in the AI world. Although I do have hope because uh, at the last congressional hearings, um, w one of the, the, uh, the Congress people uh, had mentioned um, the, so in, in aerospace, there is something called DO-178C certification. Okay. Um, this is actually a software certification. It, it's independent of aerospace. It's independent of, I think they use it in a few other uh, transportation areas. And this specific certification guarantees a safety of software that's used in these, uh, you know, life or death, mission critical uh, mm -hmm. applications. So, for example, um, we just went through the whole Boeing 737 MAX uh, issue again, right? Uh, another one. Um, this time it was a hardware issue, right. and that airplane has to get recertified before it's uh, FAA approved to fly again. Um, there's a hardware certification, and I forget what the acronym is for that, but there's also the uh, software side of it, and that's what impacted the previous uh, right. 
disasters. With, with the throttle up thing, right? Yeah. Right, the throttle thing. That was a software issue, right? right. Uh, and the reason why we were feeling safe to fly on the, that aircraft after that was resolved was because we knew that they had to go back into the code, identify the bugs, mm -hmm. fix it. And that guarantees that that will never happen again. Right. Maybe a different failure mode would happen, but that failure mode would never happen again. Right. Sure. Um, you can't do that with traditional machine learning uh, using neural nets. They are black boxes. There's no way to introspect inside of them. There's no way to bug fix. And then there's other privacy issues as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I use a, I use Chat GPT and and other you know uh, language models quite often, and it, it's I've done some testing and playing around with it, and I can give the same prompt to the same you know Chat GPT at two different times, really changing nothing and get different results, right? With yeah. no other prompts, no other differences, other than this time it spits something else out, trying to get re repetition. And, you know, I've built some, some AI tools in the background to integrate with other stuff. And, and same thing, like sometimes, you know, 90% of the time it's great. And then it just throws you this random curveball. It's like, where did that come from? Like, right. and this is not public chat GPT stuff. This is local models, right? Running in a very small environment. I've only given it my data. So like, but it still just comes out of randomness and it just guesses and you're not like, no, not, that's not right. Like, why, how did you get there? And there's no way to track its logic from, okay, it did this and then it did this and then it did this. And that's how it got to here. So I can fix that last step. Like you said, right. there's no way to do that. I just have to continually go back through it and try to retrain it better. But there's no, there's no logical path to tell it to stop doing that. That's not right. Don't give me that answer again. It's not the right answer. That's right. You're always going to be behind the eight ball with, with neural nets. Right. Um, and you just described the fact that it's non-deterministic, right? right? Uh, we need software, especially safety, mission critical, privacy, legal, you know, uh, software that is deterministic. Yeah. We need to know that it will always do this thing given that input, not change right. it right. randomly, right? right? And with neural nets, you start off with a random seed. That's, you know, step one, <laughs> start off with a random yeah. seed. So everything that follows uh, is, is based off of that. And it doesn't matter if you lock down that random seed and you say, okay, I'm always going to use this number. What was the intent behind using that number? Right. And why not a different number, right? right? So it's because of that that you actually have this black box problem that, like, it manifests itself in so many different ways. Uh, one of them being what you just said, which is different outputs, the non deterministic outputs of it, right? Another way it manifests itself is as hallucinations. Mm -hmm. it, it just makes things up, right? Um, another problem, uh, especially in the privacy space, is that there's no way to prove that that neural net model didn't use your personal data. Right. Uh, again, there's no way to introspect inside that model and say, ah, here's Aaron's data. This is Aaron's record. Uh, Aaron asked us not to use this anymore, so we have to remove it. You actually have to throw that model out, right. go back to your original data, remove your record from that data, then retrain the whole system again. Right. And estimates of like how much it costs to train ChatGPT and uh, range everywhere from like four million to twelve million dollars just for training. So every time you have to retrain it, every time there's another Aaron that says, "No, no, don't use my data." You have to go through that process, right? Uh, with our system, it's a simple matter of identifying that record and deleting it. It's right. gone, right? So we could we could show complete traceability of our predictions all the way back to the specific records used at training time that generated that prediction. And if somebody says, "I don't want you to have my record anymore," all we have to do is delete that. Right, and that's that's a lot of the concern around, you know, if you look at operations, if you look at, you know, critical infrastructure, you talked about TSA, you talked about, you know, trains and airplanes and power plants and, you know, all this type of stuff. We can't deal in, 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 in what ifs, like we can't have, it has to be predictable. It has to be reliable. And I have to be able to troubleshoot it down to exactly where it failed so that I can fix it 
or it doesn't make sense. The the the, the cons and the and the and the negatives far outweigh the wins of the value added and efficiencies in a power plant or in a in a in an airplane. Like when you're flying thirty thousand feet above the air, you can't risk one little thing going wrong and crashing the plane, right? It, it's just not worth the risk. So it has to be in something that you can guarantee repeatable, traceable, bug fixable, like all of those types of things. And I, to your point, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, a novice at best in, in this AI stuff, but even just a little bit that I've played with it, I know there's no way I could take this to a power plant and have it run a power plant or have it run, you know, look at the AI driving, you know, Tesla and the self-driving cars. And, you know, you see things all the time. Like if you want to fail it, just put a, a, a cone on the hood. Or, you know, I was, I was rucking in downtown Austin and one of those self-driving taxis was there. And I just stood like he was taking the, the car. He, I called it a he, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> the car was turning right on the street that I was crossing. And I just stood there just to, it was like four o'clock in the morning. Nobody around it was just me and the car just sat there and, and it did what it, I was just wondering if it was going to freak out or, or just go straight like I had no idea what it would do I just wanted to see what it would do so I stood there for like five minutes waiting to see what it would do and it just sat there with its blinker on and just sat and sat and sat and then as soon as I got to the sidewalk it went so there's some things about it that they figured out but what happens if that thing went haywire and it decided i've waited long enough for you know whatever like there's there's way too many variables in most of these scenarios to be comfortable to use these in production where safety lives criticality is important yeah it's cool to run it for marketing and to post a youtube video or something like that but where 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 stuff is 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 mission critical it's just not there and i, I just don't see a path to all the reasons that you just pointed out how that general, you know, chat GPT version of, of, of AI could ever get to a place where I would feel comfortable trusting my life, my kid's life, my, my community, my country's life on, uh, it's, it's, it's scary. Right. Uh, Aaron, you're a lot braver than I am. I, I would have not stood in front of that car. Uh, <laughs> so one of, one of the great things about, um, what chat GPT has exposed for society, uh, is this very specific thing about hallucinations. So again, that's because of the underlying neural network. Now we understand it because we've been playing with it, right? <clears throat> so as, as a society, we've now played with ChatGPT. We put in prompts and we've gotten different outputs. And whenever we're asking it to actually uh, give us information, I always go and Google it afterwards anyway, so I have to confirm it. Um, sure. But, you know, the fact that we are now able to see these things in action and intuit that, hey, wait a second, this really isn't what people are telling us it is. You know, it's not that magic genie that everyone's talking about. Sure. Um, now translate that over to an autonomous car, like the one you were standing in front of. <laughs> um, the prompt is the environment around the yeah. car, including right. you. And I don't know how many times that car cycled through that same prompt. With, was it every second, every millisecond, whatever. Um, but that's basically putting in the same prompt over and over and over again. And you're hoping that it's not going to run you over. <laughs> right? It gets the same result every time. <laughs> you hope, right? And then there's that hallucination part that, hey, it might think that, you know what? That's not a person standing in front of me. Uh, that is a floating ghost or something, <laughs> you right. know, whatever, right? And I could go right through it. And this is what happened with, uh, and, and it, I believe it was Tesla, uh, the car that killed a pedestrian crossing the street with a bicycle, and there was a, a bag ha hanging from the, the handle. Mm -hmm. And after the, the tragedy, um, everyone was looking for an explanation, mm -hmm. right? And the engineers weren't able to find an explanation. Right. They came up with theories. Right. right. We don't need theories of why something went wrong. We need to identify yeah. what went wrong yeah. and fix it to guarantee it doesn't happen again. Right. Uh, so that's, that's uh, my concern when it comes to, to neural nets. Great for chat GPT. Like, th I, I love using it. Uh, it helps me reword uh, mm -hmm. paragraphs and sentences and get my grammar correct because those mm -hmm. are I'm, I'm from New York. Like we, <laughs> we, uh, 
our, our grammar is supposed to be wrong. It, 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 we've invented our own here. Um, That's right. But, but like those tools are great for some things, like you mentioned, you know, uh, video games and uh, social media. I, I, I would say no to. Like I, I wouldn't think they're they're actually good for social media because they sway people, right? Sure. And then uh, we don't know why they're swaying people. Are they swaying people because someone has trained it to make you a little bit more towards the left, a little bit more towards the right, or right. a little extreme in, in whichever direction? Um, or is it just you know the algorithm uh, is doing what it thinks it's supposed to be doing because it's extracting the features that it thinks are important, and maybe they're not, maybe they're biased, right? Sure. Um, so we need to be able to identify all those things along the way before we uh, put these things into production environments. So, so we we kick this off with with you know development of of, of code and how we keep, how we create applications. And I 100 percent agree with you. Unfortunately, I still think that uh, code that's being created today is not done you know with necessarily security in mind. Like maybe right. it's a line item, but it's still functionality first. We'll figure out how to secure it after the fact. Um, and, and that is, you know, it's whack-a-mole. It's, it's why there's so many vulnerabilities. It's why there's so many, you know, uh, unknowns, you know, software bill of materials is coming out that should, you know, hopefully help at least shine a light on some of those things, but still like it really starts with when I create the code. So what is the, the use case, uh, talk through that with, with, you know, how does, how does a product like what you guys are talking about, how does that help to, you know, bring AI into these environments, do it in a safe way, do it in a secure way where I know I can track it down. How, how does that happen? Like, is that, is that you guys building it? Is that integrating with other software developers? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Great question. So our technology is a base technology. So the framework itself can be deployed in any use case. Right. Okay. Any use case that requires artificial intelligence, machine learning, or computer reasoning. Right? Sure. Um, so we let our customers decide what those use cases are. Our ultimate goal is to put our platform out for public use. Okay. Right? So right now, it's in private beta. Uh, we work with some uh, specific customers. Um, they're able to create these agents. Uh, we've taught them how to build these agents uh, mm -hmm. and deploy them. Um, our system uses four API calls to get all okay. of machine intelligence uh, into your application layer. And because we separate out the data layer from the intelligence layer from the application layer, the customers are able to control their data. Right. We don't have to integrate it into the agent. Sure. Right? So they own their data. Uh, they don't have to expose it. Uh, and, and that you know allows them to do a lot more things that they weren't able to do with with neural nets. So basically, they, they uh, come up with their their data, and they don't need tremendous amounts of data because our system is analytical, not statistical, right? Okay. So you don't need a tremendous amount of data. So explain uh, the, explain the difference between the two there, real quick. Yeah, great question. So statistics require a shit ton of data. Sure. Okay? Uh, you, gobs you can't and gobs a, of it. That, that right. way I can, right, right. Right. You right. can't have a few samples of something and say, hey, you know, <laughs> we're done with this. Uh, right. Polling results, for example, right? Uh, if you walked around, let's say you walked around our New York City office here and mm -hmm. polled 10 people, you're going to get a very skewed political viewpoint. Based on where you're right. at, the the, yeah. the demographic, the the time of day, uh, right. a lot of things are going to skew those numbers. Sure, exactly, okay. exactly. And you can't extrapolate from that and say, well, the entire country is now whatever we are here, right? <laughs> right. 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 Um, so, for statistical systems, you need a tremendous amount of data mm -hmm. across the entire um, population sure. size. Right. So you have to sample. Uh, large amounts. And the more data you have, uh, the, the, the better the results should be, right? Right. Um, well, analytical is completely different, right? Um, think of Noonan's law, F equals MA. Mm -hmm. That's analytical. We found mm -hmm. a function. Right. We plug in the, the mass, we plug in the acceleration, we know what the force is going to be. Right. Right? We don't have to have millions of examples with different masses and different accelerations. You know, in, in the beginning, uh, this was done to like 
not millions of examples, but like dozens of examples. And mm -hmm. uh, a model was created, an analytical model was created to prove out the formula. Uh, but then you don't have to keep doing that every single time. You have the formula. Right. <laughs> so, that, so flip it on the head there. If I, if I go ask those same 10 people and I have that equation, then that equation can help me to see if this is accurate, if the equation is right. Cause I can go ask those 10 people. Then yeah. I can go to another state and ask 10 people. I can go to another country and ask 10 people. And in theory, if the formula is accurate, it should play out no matter who I ask and when I ask them. That's exactly right. So uh, these form different cohorts. Each sure. cohort has their own pattern. You only need to see a pattern once in an analytical system, okay. right? In statistical systems, you need to see variations of that pattern millions, millions of times before it becomes useful. Right. Uh, yeah. Going back to the car, me standing in front of the car, a, a smaller <laughs> human may it may not have seen and seen the you know me as a human yeah. if I was too short or maybe thought it was a dog or or any number of scenarios it has to understand all of those different things. If I was super tall, maybe it thought I was a tree. Um, right. You know, I, I can see where that can be a problem. Whereas a statistical would would say you know a plus b equals c every time. Right? It doesn't matter the height or you know the the difference is is there. So how how does that help? So uh, I love that. So the the local, especially in OT, data is important, right? So there's there's all sorts of regulations around how do I secure my data? Can I put stuff in the cloud? Like I don't want my proprietary, you know, if you think about Coca-Cola, like their their secret, you know, recipe for Coke, they don't want to get that. They, they don't want to put that in chat GPT because obviously then Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and all these others can get it. So if they can use a local model that they're guaranteed and, and it's statistical and it doesn't, they own their data. It sounds like your agent basically just accesses a call. Hey, there's, I need to request this data. Okay. There's the data lake. I go grab or whatever it is. I go grab that data from the repository, bring it down in, crunch the data, and then I'm done with it, right? I don't hold it. I don't house it. I'm just accessing it to, to, to fill a variable in my equation, and then I get an output, and then I'm done with it. I don't need to keep it anymore. Is that, is that fairly accurate? Right. That's right. So our, our models, we call them information models, not data models, right? Okay. Uh, because what they're doing is they're extracting the information from the data, and they're processing that information. So it becomes more general. We could apply it to multiple use cases. So okay. those information models or configurations of our agents uh, can be static, right? And the only thing that needs to change is that data. So sure. as the data changes from one domain to another or from one customer use case to another, uh, that that same agent, now with the different data, it's filled this knowledge base with, sure. is now capable of uh, solving that customer's problems. What are some some example use cases you're excited about? It, and they can be theoretical. I'm not asking for specific client stuff, but yeah. what's some scenario type things that you're excited that you see this really being a differentiation in? So one one thing that's uh, near and dear to my heart is in cybersecurity, actually. Sure. Uh, so security operations centers require uh, a team of analysts to sit there and watch hundreds of millions of records flying mm -hmm. by uh, their screens. And these records are uh, often generated from signatures, which are, back to those expert systems, hand-generated yep. rules right, right. to identify specific types of patterns. Right. But as a SOC analyst, you're not sitting there and looking at each signature that fires and saying, ah, that's malicious activity, let me escalate this. What you're doing is you're looking at a, a pattern of signatures mm -hmm. that fire. And you're looking at that pattern within the context of everything else that's around it and saying, ah, this looks malicious. Let sure. me estimate this. Or nope, this is the IT guy doing their daily job, right? right. Um, so you have to have that, that context in that too. Uh, the thing that I'm most excited about right now uh, is applying our Gaius platform to cybersecurity. And we've come out with a product called CyberSoc okay. that allows um, different environments, so different network environments, to just stand this up, have the system baseline their network in real time. So it actually can learn in real time. Okay. Uh, we don't have to go through uh, an expensive, long, dragged out training period. So it baselines their, their network in real time and then identifies anomalies that are occurring there because those are the patterns that it hasn't seen before. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike with, let's say, a neural net, 
if we were to try this with the neural net, uh, we would have to train it, and, and this is what people have been trying to do, train it to identify anomalies. But by definition, an anomaly is something that you haven't seen before, so you wouldn't have the data for it. Sure. It's something new. It's the black swan event, right? right? right. Uh, with our system, we could identify those black swans because of the fact that it's not already in its knowledge base. Right. So it says, hey, this is a pattern I haven't seen before, which means that our system is capable of catching zero days. Okay. Uh, so, so that's one of the uh, exciting things. Another thing that we could do with this is train it on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those customers who want a little bit more sophistication in their results and not just, uh, hey, this is telling us that th this is malicious activity, which they could click on and trace through and understand exactly the whole picture, right? Uh, 360 degree view of that event or series of events and sequences uh, and identify uh, whether it's malicious or benign activity. Uh, but but you could do a lot more with something like the MITRE ATT&CK framework, right? Mm -hmm. You could uh, have this system tell the analyst, hey, this is the specific type of attack that's occurring uh, and this is how to defend against it. So we could also include actions to the system that an analyst or you know the business decides uh, they would allow the system to automatically take on their behalf to mitigate those threats in real time, to defend against them in real time. And this plays into the whole self-healing networks and self-healing computers and all that as well. Yeah, and I, I can even see a use case because you know one of the one of the struggles that we have, and, and again, I keep going back to OT and, and, and you know, manufacturing and, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe I don't want, I don't want it to take control of the airplane, but I can at least pop a screen up on, on the pilot's thing and say, hey, this is going on. What you should do, procedure ABC, right? Um, and, and give the operator that way they're not having to, oh, what's going on? I'm having to figure out which procedure should I use, you know, uh, but more quickly, you know, be able to differentiate, you know, look at the, uh, the SOC analyst you talked about, like I'm looking through all of this code or all these alerts, trying to find the needle in the stack of needles. If I can see this pattern and pop it up and say, hey, it looks like ABC is going on. You've got a run book that says to do this. I think you should initiate this run book because of these reasons. Or maybe there's two options. I'm not exactly sure. It could be either A or B. Um, the scenario is different, but but having that pop up that that's a that's a one way and I, I see that as a path especially in critical infrastructure and OT and transportation and, and, and aero you know aerospace type things where you want them to you know get that thing up quicker so they can respond maybe I don't want it to automatically respond for me but at least I want it to pop up and say you know a this is what we think it's going to do we got 95 percent pr probability that this is right. right this is what we think you should do but you're the analyst you you click the button like I, I'm not going to fire the missile but I at least want to say you should think about firing in the missile. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So our customers want human in the loop and human on the loop. Right. Right. So um, our platform allows both uh, as well as fully autonomous. So the way I see uh, AI ML uh, playing out over the next few years would be people need to start feeling comfortable with these systems before they can fully trust them. Right. Sure. So, Having a human in the loop and a human on the loop is an absolute necessity. We can't just go straight to fully autonomous because we need to be able to trust these systems. And to build that trust, you have to have a whole bunch of things in play, right? You have to have the, those kinds of certifications that we spoke about, that DO1CMBC, which proves out the deterministic nature and that you could go in and fix uh, errors that appear and that it's, it's also cyber secure, right? Um, so those are important bits to it, but also experience over time, right? Um, we, we have to know that this system is not going to hallucinate and it has right. to be guaranteed, right? And we could guarantee all of that with certifications and paperwork and everything. But you also have to have people who aren't, uh, you know, in the tech world, they're, they're not the experts. Just like when they bring in someone, uh, you know, I don't know if your, your kids are old enough to drive, but if they're old enough to drive, you're not just going to hand them the keys to the car and say, okay, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're going to be in the car with them for a while, yeah. right? You're going to watch yeah. what they do. You're going to see what, where they're looking, and you're going to provide that advice back before you have enough trust in them to allow them to go on, on their own. 
So uh, similarly with uh, autonomous uh, applications. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do have a 15 year old that's in the process of getting his learner's permit, all that kind of stuff. So that one hit very close to home. I definitely am not <laughs> going to let him drive on his own. Although he's a good driver. He's, he's, he's safe. He's still, he's just an experience. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a matter of, it's not that he's, you know, overly aggressive or, 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 you know, he's got a seatbelt on, he's not paying attention to his phone. He's, he's 10 and two, you know, the whole nine yards, but still he just hasn't driven enough right and in, in the back seat or even in the passenger seat you're not you just don't get it it's different than being by, behind the wheel and making those splits of d decisions and like you said it's the same thing of there's so many scenarios and the only way you can go through those scenarios is to be in them right so you know what happens when you come to this intersection is there a four-way stop like which directions do i look and there's a car and you know and, and and the other piece of that is you know i can be in the right and still get in an accident right i can do all the right things and somebody else cannot be paying attention and hit me so i have to be defensive and pay attention to others that aren't doing following the rules and and all of those things it's no different than in these AI spaces. And, and in, in my cyber world, you know, grow, doing operations and things like that in these spaces, when I brought in these new technologies, the way I've been successful is doing exactly what you talked about, right? Is I would have them be in parallel. So back in the day when, when we were implementing, you know, next generation firewalls, so application aware firewall rules, right? Everybody uses them now, but 15 years ago, we weren't using them in OT. Um, so when we brought them into the plants, I would set up two rules. I would set an old school port and, and protocol rule and, and right above it or right below it, I would set a, you know, application aware rule, right? And, or above it, sorry. So I would want it to flow through the application rule and never get to the port rule. And I would let it run for X number of months, maybe even a year to prove that this rule was passing all the traffic it needed to. It wasn't having to get to that next port you know, port and protocol rule because it was passing it there. And then after six months, a year or whatever, where there was zero hits on that, that port and protocol rule, then I could disable it and everybody was comfortable. Right. Yeah. So the same scenario would probably be, I'd want to have this thing running on the side and compare it to an operator said I should do X, Y, Z. What did the AI system say? And assuming that they mirror or what, you know, they're at least close and they're not way out of left field. I don't have any ghosts in the system. Right. I don't have any, Oh, you should, you know, shut the plant down at the in the middle of the night for no reason. And right. I feel confident. Then I can start transitioning some non-critical systems prove it in a non-critical system and then expand it until everybody is comfortable with it running and making either, you know, a human in the loop or, you know, trying to get to an automated you know, autonomous type type scenario, which I believe will happen. It's just a matter of what is that timeline, especially in some of these critical, critical uh, environments. Right. Right. Yeah. Very cool. So awesome. So, we, we talked a little bit about it, but, you know, next five to 10 years, what is something that you're really excited about coming up uh, over the horizon? And maybe something that's a little concerning that we need to adjust yeah. or shift or really look towards to make sure we don't impact us in a negative way. So let me start with the concerning part first, because sure. uh, this is a very real issue uh, and a possibility. Um, so right now there's a, a, a group called the G34 uh, okay. which works out of the SAE, um, and they are looking at ways of allowing um, some sort of certification process for neural networks to be able to fly on commercial aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and their thinking is, and, and I, I understand their thinking, if there weren't alternative uh, possibilities or alternative technologies that could do the things that we need done, but mm -hmm. their thinking is, you know, we have to progress. Uh, we need uh, autonomous aircraft, and uh, we have these neural nets that allow us to uh, get there. Um, let's figure out a way, because they cannot pass that DL-1 and BC certification. Right. Uh, it's, it's just not possible. All, all, all the safety regulations uh, forbid these non-deterministic black boxes. Uh, so they're trying to figure out ways of allowing that to fly on civil aviation, right? Uh, I am extremely opposed to this. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me bring up adversarial attacks as an example. And I, I think uh, your audience working in cyber would appreciate this. 
you've seen maybe the adversarial attacks on uh, a picture of a panda where by changing just a few pixels, um, they were able to confuse a neural net into thinking that panda was, a, a, I think, like a cat or something. Right. Now, imagine a vehicle, you know, whether it's a car driving down the street and someone puts a sticker on a stop sign, which we see here all the time, mm-hmm. that tricks the neural net into thinking that's not a stop sign, right? right? It doesn't look suspicious. It's just some small sticker or a few stickers that doesn't change the... Uh, the whole view of a stop sign, mm-hmm. but changes some of those pixels that the neural net uh, observes, thinking now it's something else, right? Right. Um, or similarly for an aircraft, like, and, and this is a nightmare scenario for me, where um, possibly a terrorist mows it down alone somewhere right. out in the field right. uh, that is um, underneath a flight path, and they mow a pattern into the, the grass there that tricks the aircraft into thinking that it is pulling up. Mm-hmm. And suddenly that aircraft is doing a nosedive, just like the 737 MAX issue that we saw a couple sure. years back. Yeah. So that, that's my uh, you know fear. Uh, it, it translates also into other domains, right? And I, I think when Congress looks into this matter further, they will understand that there is already a precedent for software safety, and that is DO-178C standard, right? They just need to apply that across the board for all AI ML that is in any way affecting life, liberty, or limb, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, And the positive, what? On the the positive side, (laughs) now that I've gone through like the the doomsday scenario of it. Mm-hmm. Um, on the positive side, um, I, I see an acceleration of these technologies, um, but there is like a, a large trend of people looking at uh, doing this properly, right? Not just throwing this out there and uh, and hoping for the best. So I, I do see an acceleration of technology in the right direction. Um, we should be able to work alongside of these machines to get our jobs done, not to replace our jobs, but to make ourselves more efficient, uh, more performant, right? Um, So, for example, if you had that CyberSOC agent um, in a SOC where there's a new analyst sitting at that Mm -hmm. screen, and it's guiding the analyst, hey, look at this pattern, right? Right. I think this is malicious because of this, that, or whatever. Or this other pattern I think is uh, benign because of this, that, or whatever. Or the analyst finds a pattern and they ask the AI, give me a little bit of information about this so that I can understand what's possibly happening behind the scenes before I escalate this up and becomes a full concept, right? So we could elevate everyone's standards, right? Everyone's performance by using systems like this, working alongside us. So the human in the loop, on the loop, that human becomes better along the way. Oh yeah, I I see huge uh, implications, positive implications from a training perspective. I'm working with a a, a group right now that's doing some, you know, normal old school tabletop exercises, you know, cybersecurity type things, but using AI to to help drive those. So you're not having to have these static, boring, you know, um, uh, tabletops, but integrating using AI, local models, that kind of thing, don't need to solve world hunger. We're just giving it some basic data and being able to be, you know, have a, 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 a not static uh, tabletops. You can ask it questions. You can give it responses. You can have it, you know, do a command line and, and really do a lot more things. It, and it does a lot of things. I can do the same exercise multiple times and get different results. So I learned the first time, hey, I should have done, I should have responded quicker or done this quicker. So I can do the same thing again. And because I did earlier, I, I took a different action, it takes me down a different path, right? And it's not a it's not a static, you know, old school, you know, storybook adventure game where, you know, I get to question one, there's three choices, and then, you know, there's a there's a finite number of answers I can get to. When I use AI to expand that amount of options and, and the flexibility, I can turn it into a game. I can have more fun with it, but I can train my people 
better, right? I can have them see more scenarios in a very easy, safe environment. So when that SOC analyst two weeks in, where used to, it took years to train a SOC analyst to get from, you know, where entry level to that next level. Imagine the ability to throw all these scenarios at them in a real world type scenario and have them respond and how much quicker they can get because when they see it in real world, oh, I've seen that. Like I've seen this exact command come up in my in this you know tabletop game or whatever right and and be able to accelerate the the effectiveness of all of our people um, that much faster because of AI. So to your point, it's not taking away from it's enhancing and making all these people more efficient and more capable um, uh, to do the things that you want them focused on. Right, I love that. I love the yeah. whole war gaming aspect of it. Perfect. It's it, it's a lot of fun. It, I I have a lot of uh, fun and, and excitement around AI, and I have a lot of concerns around it too. But it's more around bad implementation than it is the technology. I believe the technology is amazing and incredible and can can do a lot of things. It's like you know the car or the airplane. Like you know, yes, there's some risks, but if done well, then it can really enhance all humanity and make us all better at our job. Now, there's also some risk because the bad guys have it too. So we have to be watching out for those things too. So, well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. What? How do people get a hold of you? Like, what? What is your call to action for for anybody listening wants to know more about AI and what you guys do? Sure. So our our company is called Intelligent Artifacts. So they could go to intelligent-artifacts.com. Uh, they could also hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I post very frequently about all these issues there as well. So uh, it's uh, LinkedIn forward slash in forward slash Slovakovakians. And I'm sure the link will be in the link. Below. Yeah, we'll put all that in the show notes for sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, awesome, sir. Thank you very much for your time today. It was an awesome conversation. Uh, let's let's do it again sometime, maybe in the in six to six to nine months, and see what's changed because of this stuff. I know is changing super fast, and lots of new new developments coming in. So I appreciate your time today, sir. Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Thanks for joining us on Protect It All, where we explore the crossroads of IT and OT cybersecurity. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to stay ahead in this ever evolving field. Until next time.